I'm Travis Gamotes. I'm a labor and employment partner here at Jeffrey Mangles and a member of uh, JMBM's Global Hospitality Group, uh, which is chaired by my partner, Jim Butler, who uh, is here with us today. Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're glad to have you with us on this JMBM webinar. Uh, this is going to be short, sweet, and direct and on an issue that is uh, at the top of almost everybody's mind. Um, we're still in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, people are worried about uh, closings and openings and face masks, but now on top of everything else, we have vaccinations. Uh, two approved vaccinations, uh, two FDA approved vaccinations in the United States uh, with what it looks like two more coming on board in the, in the next very few weeks. The, uh, all the news seems to be about shortages of supply, problems in distribution, promises to get this, uh, the kinks worked out, uh, original projections of having adequate vaccine and vaccinating everyone who wanted one by uh, the end of June. Now look a little optimistic, but um, we're going to get this fixed and it does look like it's just going to kick it out a little bit. So maybe it isn't the end of June, maybe it's September or end of the year. But along with this, um, uh, this rollout, uh, it, initially everyone is fighting to get the vaccine and waiting to be eligible for it and, and uh, finding that their vendors don't have enough. That's going to get fixed. But the next question is, can and should employers require their workers to take the vaccine? So let me get straight into it. Uh, Travis, uh, help us out. Tell us a little bit about what you and uh, the other attorneys in our labor and employment group are doing and how you're helping with the COVID first and then launch right in. Certainly, yes. Uh, 2020 and continuing into 2021 have certainly been a uh, unique year uh, for our industry uh, in, in global hospitality. Um, and as, as uh, labor and employment specialists, we have, uh, we have dealt with the, with the gamut, you know, from advising our hospitality clients, um, you know, and, and how to deal with the pandemic, how to deal with, unfortunately, with furloughs and layoffs that, that certainly happen. Now, as we're starting to ramp up, how safely to do that how to protect our workforce, how to protect our, our, our customers and our guests. Uh, so it's been, uh, it's, it's been a, it's been a, a you know, a, 11 months, like, like no other. And, uh, and, and as Jim alluded to, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're not quite out of the woods yet. Um, but, um, but we are optimistic that we will be uh, getting there soon. And, and the, uh, the vaccines uh, are, are a big step towards that. Uh, and of course, um, my, you know, all, all of our clients in the global hospitality group across the country and, and even internationally, of course, have very significant concerns um, because of the, the, of, of the, you know, the proven success rates of these vaccines, you know, at 95% um, uh, uh, protection from this horrible uh, COVID-19 coronavirus um, uh, is, is, much you know, much higher than was was anticipated uh, when when the world set out to to create these vaccines. Uh, you know, new systems of vaccination that uh, that have proven highly successful. But of course, there is a a significant group of uh, of, of of our of our population that uh, does not believe in in vaccines, uh, and of course, they've been able to seize upon. Uh, some some uh, reports of uh, of negative reactions um, to the vaccines, uh, and and there's a lot of of misinformation out there, and and there's there is some uh, truthful information about there regarding you know the efficacy of these vaccines. What we're going to focus on today uh, is as as an employer uh, in the, primarily in the hospitality industry, and if you're not in the hospitality industry, um, these there will still be excellent takeaways. We'll probably have another. Uh, webinar that uh, that's a little more broader, but this the, today's presentation does focus on our industry and hospitality. What are the pitfalls uh, of uh, and what are what are the employer's rights in mandating vaccines uh, for our workforce? So uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, and uh, start the the PowerPoint presentation. 
Um, let's see here. All right. So work life in the time of Corona, uh, vaccine mandates and practicalities. Uh, here's a little bit about myself. When you get the, the materials, um, uh, we, we, we're a full service labor and employment law firm. Uh, there's, there's Jim, uh, who uh, the chairman of, of our department. Uh, his name is on my business card, and uh, we've been you know, great friends since I've been a member of this firm for, for going, uh, going on 16 years. Um, and of course, today's focus is going to be on this, this discrete issue of vaccinations, but um, we, we help our, our clients in the hospitality uh, space in the whole gamut, every operational issue, uh, myself and, and uh, my other labor and employment partners uh, and attorneys at, at our firm are at your disposal to help with, with any and all of these issues. We'll touch upon uh, these areas a little bit later. All right, so mandatory vaccination for the workforce. What are the practicalities and the legalities? So we are certainly gonna be focusing on, on the legalities, uh, but we also want to discuss the practicalities because uh, as we well know, there's certainly an intersection between what, what can we legally do and what, what practically makes sense. So uh, mandatory vaccination, uh, what, what are the requirements in, in such a scenario? Well, what, what we do have, uh, we do know uh, that the CDC has deemed uh, that, uh, that, the, that, that the coronavirus is a direct threat. And the, the, uh, the government agency that enforces our uh, laws for uh, protecting against uh, discrimination, uh, the EEOC, they've agreed with this. And what that means is that there is a significant risk of substantial harm to the health and safety of the individuals or others uh, that cannot be reduced um, by reasonable accommodation. So what that, as long as this designation remains in place and, and, uh, and it, it, uh, there, there's been no indication that, uh, that it will be changed, even though I will point out that designation was created under a prior presidential administration, but there, there's, no, there's no indication that that designation is going to change. What that allows for, the, for, for an employer uh, in hospitality and, and any other uh, employer uh, in the US is that um, when steps can be taken to protect uh, the, hub, the public and the other workforce from this direct threat that those steps can be taken. And the, uh, the vaccination, uh, the vaccines have proven to be effective. Um, you know, the, the, the side effects have, have proven to be relatively minimal. Um, you know, latest statistics put the side effects at the, 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 the coronavirus vaccine as, as a little bit greater than uh, the vaccination that we get for our our annual flu shot. So, so the, the, the effects uh, aren't, aren't off the charts such that, um, that the, the vaccination is rendered, rendered ineffective. So the question is, uh, if an employer is permitted to mandate vac uh, vaccination of its workforce, what are the limitations on that ability of the employer to mandate it? So first of all, the most critical aspect of this is that the employer, and if they're going to mandate vaccination for its workforce, they need to demonstrate that this worker, with, with, but for the vaccination, would be putting a direct substantial harm to the health and safety uh, of, of others uh, if that vaccination does not take place. So um, certainly if, in the hospitality context, if you have um, front-facing uh, employees uh, you know, who are, you know, you know, in, in the F and B operations, uh, who are, you know, interacting with the guests, uh, who are interacting with the public, um, that would be, uh, sort of, sort of the, the, the initial litmus test as to whether or not you could mandate vaccination for that aspect of the workforce. Uh, conversely, uh, you know, if you have, you know, somebody, you know, working in, you know, you know, back of the house operations, somebody who does not come into contact with, uh, with, with other workers uh, or, other, uh, or, or the public, then the justification is weakened. Uh, so that's a very, very important distinction to make. Um, somebody who can work from home, if there's an operation, an aspect of the operation where they can work from home or where they can work remotely, where they're not coming into contact with others, 
um, that is somebody who, if they did not want to be uh, vaccinated, uh, you would you would not be able to mandate that under current EEOC guidelines. Um, and then, of course, there are the rollout strategies. Um, you know, uh, you know, from the practical standpoint, um, to to mandate vaccination of the workforce, you know, especially now, uh, you know, it's, it, would, it really wouldn't be practical because, you know, vaccination uh, doses are not available for, for the entire workforce, you know, those are being limited. Um, but assuming that, you know, for those who are able to be vaccinated, um, you know, an employer can, can, can mandate that if that is, that if it's available for, for that person, given, you know, either their age or whatever group they happen to be in, um, to, to go ahead and require that. Um, the other strategy, of course, uh, is during this, this period of time when vaccines are not widely available, they're becoming more available, uh, you know, to, to cre keep this as, as, a, uh, as a voluntary process and then sort of take a wait and see a, uh, approach as to when, when the, vaccina the vaccinations become more, more available, more widespread, Will there be a point in time where the employer would want to switch from a voluntary vaccination um, policy to a mandatory vaccination policy? So, so uh, Travis, let me just jump in here because I, I, we have had extensive, and I won't call them heated, uh, uh, but full discussions of the issue. Uh, a practical point is I don't think I've ever seen uh, a medical issue that is so uh, potentially divisive as the vaccination. There is a component of our public that feels everybody should get this. They are threatening uh, the lives of, of uh, families and uh, children and everyone if anyone does not get the vaccination and they probably would require somebody to go house to house and make sure it's done if, they, if it were up to them. Uh, and then there's a portion uh, that, whether that's 20 or 30%, but it is a noticeable portion that is just the anti-vaxxers uh, that uh, don't believe in vaccines, uh, 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 think that the forcing to take a needle uh, is an invasion of the body and uh, they just, they're, they're very, very emotional about the issue. So whatever is done is likely to disrupt or create waves in the, in the workforce. And I guess uh, that, uh, that kind of brings us to the point, you've, you've really said it, but there's no advantage here in being out front of everybody. Um, at this point, I don't know of any brand uh, we've been checking and we don't know of Hilton, Marriott, uh, Hyatt, uh, nobody has yet mandated it that we know of. Uh, right. There are not yet state or local mandates. That's how some of the smallpox and other uh, vaccines were originally mandated by, by state law. So we're early in this, in this curve. And uh, I guess the, the question is, uh, isn't, the, isn't the better part of valor here to, as you say, uh, maybe encourage or wait and see, but uh, taking a strong position uh, about it uh, at this point doesn't seem like it has any advantages unless you want to take care of your favorite lawyers and have lots of litigation about it. Yeah, that that's exactly right, and and so I think what what's important to 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 do here, uh, you know, and our advice to our clients is to you know we you know don't be the one sticking one's neck out, um, you know it it certainly is you know too early in the game to to truly start mandating vaccinations, but what I want to discuss in today's webinar is you know, as, as, as we do move towards that, where vaccines become more prevalent and more available, um, you know, there will be, we do feel that there will be a time in the, you know, in, in, and I, I, I'm certainly predicting 2021, you know, um, is it going to be in the, the summer of 2021? Is it going to be, you know, early fall? There is going to be a point in time, though, where 
part and parcel of our society opening up and of our of our industry opening up in hospitality, where um, where where guests are going to want to ensure uh, that they're going to a place where uh, where the workforce is, has been vaccinated, um, because of the fact that you know even if you've been vaccinated yourself, um, there's still that you know five percent chance that, that you still might get the disease. So let's talk about where that stands from a legal standpoint. First of all, are there legal exemptions to vaccination? Uh, and you know, I, I did get some um, some questions that came in um, before uh, before we we started our webinar. Some from some of my clients who I know, and I appreciate those questions. But what are the legal exemptions? Well, there's two very important legal exemptions. Um, that, that every employer needs to be aware of. And that is the religious exemption and that is the health exemption. So let's talk quickly about the religious exemption. If uh, an employee has a, a quote, sincerely held religious belief um, that, uh, where, that mandates or prohibits them from being vaccinated, um, then that does qualify as a bona fide religious exemption. Um, it has to be based in religion. It can't be based upon, um, you know, uh, some other belief. Um, it doesn't, you know, they don't have to cite the, uh, you know, the, 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 the religion itself, um, but it does have to be a legitimately held religious belief uh, in order for that exemption to happen. So then the question is, if you do have an employee who has a legitimate, um, you know, legitimately held um, religious belief against vaccination, what can the employer do in that context? Does the employer, if this is a, if this is somebody who's working in food and beverage, if there's this somebody who's having direct contact with the with the guests and with other employees, um, but th yet this person has a, a bona fide, uh, strongly held religious belief, um, what does the employer? What are the employer's rights in that context? Well. Uh, under current guidance, and certainly, you know, as this, as this, you know, as this evolves, um, you know, check in with your with your uh, experienced labor lawyer. Uh, but but current guidance says that uh, that the that the employer's need for a to ensure a safe workforce uh, trumps that that religious uh, belief. Does it mean? Does not mean that the employer can compel the person who has uh, a religious objection to, to vaccination to get vaccinated. Can't, you can never do that. But the employer does have the right to either reassign that person to, to a role uh, that they can perform where they're no longer um, putting the public or other, other employees at risk. Um, but in the, in the case of somebody who doesn't have a skill set where they can work from home or if there's no job available where they can work from home, um, to 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 uh, to uh, not put that person to work, to give that person, uh, you know, either an unpaid leave of absence, um, you know, until you know there is a belief that there is sufficient herd immunity where vaccination is no longer uh, something that would be required for everybody. Um, but you know, uh, to to be able to to keep that person, even with the strongly held religious belief that that validates their decision not to be vaccinated, the employer is legally protected if they don't give them the hours of work um, because, uh, because there's, there's no reassignment or relocation uh, suitable for that employee's skill set uh, where they're not um, interacting with, uh, with, with guests, the public, or even uh, coworkers. The other um, legal exemption is a medical exemption. Uh, and there are certainly uh, you know, individuals out there who um, there is a medical reason as to why they cannot be vaccinated. Uh, and upon, certainly upon proof of, of that um, condition, you know, any, any, uh, any, any certification from, uh, from a healthcare professional uh, that, uh, that provides that, uh, that the given employee um, does have a medical reason why they should not be vaccinated or why it's risky to be vaccinated, um, you certainly could not mandate a vaccination in that context, but um, the same rules that I just described with respect to somebody who has a valid religious exemption would apply. As long as the employer can show that it is not an undue hardship on the employer to keep this person from, uh, from working, uh, then, then, a, then, a, then a medical leave of absence um, you know, would, be, would be appropriate. 
for that particular employee. Uh, of course, before the employer could, uh, could go that route, uh, they would need to go through the same calculus I just described with respect to, to the religious exemption and demonstrate that this person throughout you know, their, their skill set, the, 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 the work that they are, that they've been hired to perform and the work that they're able to perform, that there is no reasonable accommodation that would allow them um, to take a role that is not um, front facing with either the public or coworkers. So again, if this person can work from home, um, if they can demonstrate that they don't need to be around uh, other people, co public or, or coworkers uh, or guests, uh, you would need to put them in that position if that's available for, for the work that they have. Um, however, uh, if that work is, is not within their skill set, if that work is not available for, for, the, for the, the employer in question, uh, then there, there's no reasonable accommodation that would need to be made. Um, so uh, with respect to that, then the question becomes, you know, what, you know, if there is somebody who doesn't have an exemption that's recognized, and they simply refuse to be vaccinated. And they, they don't have a medical basis for it. They don't have a religious basis for it. They simply say, you know what? I, I, you know, I don't wanna be vaccinated. I don't think it's safe. Um, what can we do to that person? You know, is, there, is there some form of discipline or termination that can be, uh, that can be issued to that employee? And again, uh, to Jim's point, you know, it's very early in the process. We don't even have enough of the vaccine to go around so it's certainly premature in, at, at this point in time, but down the road, um, there may, very well may be a point in time where if an employee uh, doesn't have a, a, a medical or a religious basis to, to uh, not to be vaccinated, they simply don't wanna be vaccinated, um, they are subject to discipline, uh, which could either be you know, uh, you know, suspension, um, you know, termination if, there, if there's no work for them to do. Um, but of course, before any of those steps are taken, you certainly want to speak this through with your with uh, with your skilled uh, labor and employment council, uh, because uh, what we predict is pretty much everybody who is going to, uh, for whatever reason, not want to be vaccinated, they'll probably come up with an exemption um, that would fit a legal requirement, which would then require us as the employer to go through the steps to determine is there a reasonable accommodation for that person. You know, the same, the same steps I just described, is there uh, a work, uh, is there a role for that individual that does not involve um, uh, being uh, facing uh, the public or other, or other workers? And circumstances may change. Um, uh, the COVID pandemic could take a very nasty turn and become much more ferocious and deadly. And uh, it may be that hotel owners and operators decide that they've just got to do something to protect the public and their staff, uh, and they want to be more aggressive. But barring that, the real question is, why would you play with that hornet's nest? Why, why would you uh, want to potentially make employees unhappy? Uh, something of a challenge to keep uh, a good workforce there. If you've got uh, capable people, is, is it really that important? And while ultimately there are good legal reasons that will, that Travis has already provided, um, do you really want to go through the litigation and the hassle that takes uh, a lot of time? So um, at, at least for at this time, this is why we continue to counsel a wait and see type of approach, maybe even encouragement if you want to do that to facilitate, tell, help people find out where it's available, uh, whatever, but uh, probably at this point not to be extremely aggressive. Correct. And, um, Travis, we've gotten two of our participants who have asked a, a virtually the identical question so we probably ought to just take, take it uh, off the table. Uh, we are gonna try to open this up for discussion at the end. We'll uh, give people voices where you can raise your hand or you can uh, raise questions. But the question that has been put is effectively, uh, the vaccine only protects the person who is vaccinated 
not the people they come into contact with. So um, kind of what's the I, what's the idea here? Why do you, why do you do it? Certainly. Well, and, and the, the answer to that question is pretty, pretty straightforward in the sense that, um, you know, while we're rolling this out, um, there are going to be, you know, you know, there, there's going to be other employees in the workforce and currently under California law, um, if, uh, if an employee who does come into the workplace um, uh, you know, suffers or, or you know, tests positive for, for, the, for, for COVID-19, there is a rebuttable presumption that that employee caught the disease at the workplace. So then it's incumbent upon the employer to somehow disprove that. So to answer your question, that the, while the vaccine does protect the person uh, who is vaccinated, first of all, that's one of your employees. So, so the employer has, uh, ha has, has a, a vested interest in limiting uh, the, uh, the incidence of, uh, of COVID-19 amongst its, its workers. Given, given what I just described, that, 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 uh, that they, you could have a workers' comp claim um, based upon one of your workers testing positive. So if they're vaccinated, um, then, then there's a, a significant reduction of that happening. Um, but then also, um, you know, the person who, uh, who, who is not vaccinated, uh, there's the risk of that person giving that to another worker. So that, ex that extends the issue. And of course, uh, there's there's the there there there's the, the likelihood that you know certainly not right now but in the near future um, you know if if you if you operate a hotel and your Yelp reviews say yeah it was great until I got COVID from staying at the hotel um, you know that's going to that's going to really uh, decimate uh, our the, the business operations so okay. you know we we haven't seen it yet but you know there there may be you know a point in the near future where hotels say you know we mandate vaccinations for our workforce. You should feel safe coming to our hotel, even if you have not been able to get your vaccination yet. The idea in, in a pandemic with an infectious disease is that you've got to stop the transmission so that you don't have a large number of people who are susceptible to it and can pass it on. So it's part of uh, stamping out that, uh, that rapid geometric progression. Yeah. So, um, okay, At, Travis. I, I yeah. Uh, move along, At, obviously. Certainly. And and one other question that came in is what what are the risks to the employer of uh, for mandating a vaccine? Well, you know there is uh, there there are there are risks. First of all, uh, if an employer is mandating vaccines amongst its workforce, and and one or more of those employees uh, who is vaccinated suffers the side effects and, and is indicated uh, there are side effects that uh, that have been uh, have already been demonstrated that's a workers comp case so you know yes the employer is uh, is liable it, it would be a workers comp claim so of course make sure your workers comp policies are paid up uh, and and you know the, the future will tell us very soon as you know how many of these claims do come through the workers comp system, um, we're predicting um, significant increases in premiums uh, for workers' comp uh, during this during this this sort of get back to work phase, uh, and we're seeing some of our clients are already seeing that uh, for their workers' comp renewals. It's been a little bit of a lull um, so far because 2020 had less working hours in our industry, so there was there were less claims, but uh, it's certainly a trend that we're anticipating because of the very, you know, the, the, the very simple truth that is, if you're mandating vaccination and one of, one of your employees suffer side effects, that is a workers' comp claim. Um, you know, and, and, and obviously, you know, the side effects, you know, we, have, we don't know the whole gamut of them. Um, the good news is that, you know, that it is covered by, by that insurance and, and that, you know, as long as that is in, intact, uh, the, the employer is not going to be pay, facing, you know, personal injury claims um, based upon you know, a negative adverse reaction to a vaccine. But that said, um, you know, certainly in the rollout phase, um, you know, if the vaccine is not mandated by the employer and it's simply um, you know, encouraged uh, and the employee decides to get vaccinated and it's not mandated, um, then 
the if even if there is an adverse reaction, you might not have uh, a, a, a workers' comp claim arising out of that. But if you mandate the vaccination, if there is an adverse reaction, you are that is the risk that you that that you take uh, as the employer. And let's bear in mind, you know, quickly with respect to post-vaccination protocols, um, we still know that, as as noted, you know, um, they're, they're the, as we roll out the vaccines, they're not going to be uh, universally distributed. There's going to be percentages who aren't able to be be vaccinated. There are going to be there's going to be a percentage of our guests who aren't able to be vaccinated who, are, who won't want to be vaccinated. It's, uh, it's beyond the scope of this webinar to describe, can we mandate this of all of our hotel guests? Although I've certainly seen that question. Um, but um, that's why the protocols that we've, that we've used aren't just gonna go away. It's not as though uh, we're gonna be able to snap our fingers and do away with, uh, with, with temperature checks, um, we have wellness certifications from our workforce confirming that they have not been symptomatic. They have not been around people who are symptomatic. Um, you know, flexibility for those who cannot return because they're symptomatic or, or uh, because they've tested positive. Obviously, there are workplace protections for those who aren't able to work because they've been infected or because they've been exposed, uh, even if they haven't de demonstrated symptoms quite yet. Um, and of course, you know, during these required quarantine periods, you know, are, uh, is paid time off available for the employees, you know, we 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 you know states and of course our our federal government uh, have mandated that employers provide this time off in a paid fashion. Um, certainly, employers with unions and collective bargaining agreements, um, and even those without unions, are going to have paid time off policies that employees need to be able to use. Um, you know, when when they're required to to stay away from work unless they are able to work from home. And of course, you know, no time soon are we going to, going to be able to get uh, uh, to change our policies on social distancing, uh, you know, cleaning protocols is, of course, you know, uh, an evolving area, um, you know, providing um, personal protective equipment. Uh, we're still certainly advising that and, you know, where possible, modifying workspaces, um, you know, for those, you know, who, who, who have. Uh, who, where we can give them uh, their, their social distancing workspaces. We're still recommending that. Um, you've certainly seen, I know many of our clients have put up you know, plexiglass uh, you know, at the front desk uh, to protect uh, workers. You know, we, we can't just rip these all down uh, once, once the vaccines become more available because like I, you know, as, as, as the science has demonstrated, it's not 100% certain. So we still need to take a wait and see uh, attitude or, you know, uh, before we start um, undoing all of the, the, the pre-vaccination protocols, um, you know, we're going to need to keep those in place even, even after uh, we see more rollout of the vaccination. So then at some point, can we look for a, a return to normal or simply a new normal? You know, are there some positives that can come out of this? You know, um, you know, changes in employee attitudes. Uh, you know, people who uh, you know were not able to work from home, but now they are able to work from home. Once there's less of a risk of of active, um, you know, uh, you know, COVID infection, are are our employees going to have the same willingness to come to the workplace again, or uh, or will their attitudes have changed because um, they've been able to prove? You know whether in their mind or or substantively that they can do a lot of their work from home. So we're going to have some issues with respect to that. Um, you know maybe we, uh, we maybe maybe in our industry we can um, we'll, we'll find that there is uh, a virtual workforce that's maybe broader than we were when than we considered at the outset. Uh, and, and a positive takeaway maybe there's a broader employee pool. You know if there are people who can work from home. Um, and do some of the functions that you know used to require that the uh, that the that the employee come to the come to the hotel or come to come to the, the, the place of business to perform the work. If if we've made an assessment that this work can be done from home, um, then you don't need to to only hire somebody who works you know within driving distance from the property. You have a broader employee pool, so there are some positive um, takeaways that that can that can emerge from from this. All right. We, we had a couple questions come in that uh, I think we can 
uh, field here. Um, I believe, I, I think someone was, they said, you touched a little on not facilitating where to go. Is, is that even if voluntary and not mandated? I did not mean to imply that there's any problem with the employer facilitating uh, getting the, uh, the vaccine uh, at all. Uh, do you have any concerns about that in terms of identifying uh, local pharmacies, doctors, hospitals uh, that are available or even paying for or encouraging employees to do it, Travis, as opposed to mandating? No, I don't see legal issues uh, in making that information available to, to our employees. Um, and uh, one of the our participants raised the question that I think is kind of shows some of the legitimate concerns on why employers might uh, mandate, uh, not just out of a um, fervor or political decision. Uh, if you have a workplace that has a lot of potentially vulnerable people by age or underlying conditions in order to make that workplace safe for um, those employees, uh, it would uh, obviously be a big benefit to ha have everyone vaccinated. That's really not a comment. It's just there are different reasons why you might want to encourage or, um, or facilitate. Uh, exactly. Correct. Sorry, Travis, I think we're, we're back up to date with all that. Yeah, so I mean, I think that, that you know, I mean, that, that, that's really the, the, the presentation and the material that, that we wanted to discuss specifically, uh, kind of going back to uh, a slide that we showed earlier, you know, um, we, we have been uh, and continue to advise our hospital, hospitality clients on, you know, operating guidelines, you know, during and after this pandemic. Um, you know, we, I have clients who have, have, me on speed dial because they never know what labor issue related issue might pop up. Uh, so that's a service that we, that we provide. I, I, I'm in the, I'm in my office right now. I've, I've been coming to my office every day throughout, throughout this, this pandemic um, since, uh, since the traffic is a lot lighter. So there's that advantage. Um, we have, you know, our, our team of, of, of attorneys in the labor and employment side of the global hospitality group, um, you know, we, we keep, you know, up to date with uh, all the changes and they happen, you know, sometimes on a daily basis with respect to statewide, uh, nationwide uh, and local pandemic guidance, you know, both, you know, from, from you know, the, the new federal laws that, that have been coming out of Washington, uh, you know, and what, what our governors have said for those, those who operate in, in states other than California. We advise clients you know, throughout throughout the entire jurisdiction, throughout the United States, uh, and uh, and maintain our our knowledge base on uh, up to date in those areas. Um, the the unions uh, have been uh, a very interesting, um, uh, you know, they they played a very interesting role throughout this pandemic. Uh, as, as all of you know, who have who have union contracts at their properties, um, most of the payments. They go into the union healthcare, which of course is you know some of the most expensive healthcare you could get. Um, but when they man when it's part of your contract, you got to pay it. But typically, those payments, you know, the the healthcare component is based upon the hours worked. Uh, and in this pandemic, when our our our, our union workers, uh, their hours have been dramatically slashed. And of course, you know, for those who experience closures where there have been zero hours worked. Um, you know, that, that has, has strangled um, the unions as far as no one's paying dues when they're not working and, uh, and, and their healthcare programs are suffering um, greatly because when people aren't working, then, you know, the, the however many dollars an hour you have to pay to the fund based upon each hour of work, there's nothing to pay because no one's been working. So that, that has been, we've been um, uh, assisting our clients in dealing with these union management relations. Of course, the unions have attempted to negotiate or forced, you know, attempted to, to, to negotiate better deals for themselves since they realized that these, these deals are really bad when a global pandemic hits. And then, of course, you know, the hotel lawsuits du jour. Um, we, we always know in hospitality, uh, you know, the, there, there, there seems to be trends that affect our industry. 
as far as lawsuits, wage and hour lawsuits, uh, you know, failure to pay overtime, failure to provide meal breaks. Um, those have been very, uh, you know, th those have been sort of been the scourge of our industry. So we assist our clients in a uh, making sure their policies are as protective as possible to, to limit liability. And of course, defending our clients should, should a lawsuit of, the, of one of those natures be uh, um, uh, have, having to fall upon our, our door. The, uh, for our California employers, uh, of course, the, the minimum salary, not, not our hourly workers, but all of our, all of our hotel workers on salary, um, the minimum salary uh, has increased every year because it's tied to the minimum wage. And so I, I uh, published a white paper recently about the fact that it, unless you're paying um, the minimum salary to your salaried workforce, um, you're essentially uh, in violation of, of that minimum requirement and they are treated under the law as hourly employees entitled to overtime and meal and rest periods, even though you might call them on salary. So if you got people on salary earning uh, less than fifty-eight thousand uh, dollars in California, you might want to call um, call call me or 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 one of our other labor and employment lawyers, and uh, and of course how to avoid litigation pitfalls. Travis, thank you very much. Uh, this is really a new area. Things are evolving very rapidly. There may be federal and state regulation. There may be industry standards that develop. There are a lot of pragmatic considerations uh, to just think through whether you really want to do something. And if you do, there may be ways to accomplish it. But uh, this is a good time to stay flexible and be open-minded and be careful before you uh, leap into something. Thank and you all. I, 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 there is one question that, I, that, I, that I'm looking at now that I don't think we've addressed. And this says, if, if a mandatory vaccination policy is not imposed, could employees allege that the employer has failed to provide a safe and healthy work envi environment? You know, do we see OSHA uh, coming down on employers that don't mandate vaccination? And you know, certainly, currently, you know, um, where we stand with the, the rollout, we haven't seen that yet. But that is an area that um, that we're going to have to watch very closely. So, you know, to answer the question right now, I don't think anyone would would be able to to say that the, the employers failed to provide a, a safe work for a, work, a working environment by not having a mandatory vaccination policy. But I could see that changing. I could see that changing, in, uh, you know, as uh, as as this uh, as this um, rolls out. And yes, for those who want, you know, pre, you know, uh, an email of the presentation, um, you know, the 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 PowerPoint that I have, um, simply, you know, coordinate with uh, with our office, and we'll make sure that you do it. Uh, and uh, and then, of course, as far as recording of the webinar, we, we should we'll make we'll be sure to have that that available as well. All right. right. I think we actually can automate that, and we'll send the link to the recording uh, for everyone who uh, who attended the program. Perfect. So. Thank you very much, everybody. If you, uh, if you enjoyed this, please let Travis know. He spent uh, some time preparing for it and uh, is a real leader in the labor and employment area for hospitality. Thank you. Bye. Jim, thank you so much. Bye now.